Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we hope you've survived the heat and are cooling off inside with us as we answer your gardening questions. Our volunteers are standing by to take your call. Just dial 1-800-676-5446 with those questions. If you'd rather send us an email with pictures for a future show, that address is byf at unl.edu. Do tell us where you live and give us as much information as you can about your particular question. Do not forget to follow us on Facebook. Check out those video features on the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. So right now, let's get started with samples. Kate, you have just such a lovely sample. Yes, so today I brought some handsome caterpillars of black swallowtail butterflies. And so we can see them here. When they're um, a lot younger, they almost resemble um, bird droppings a little bit, but these caterpillars feed on plants in the carrot family, so we often see them on parsley, dill especially they seem to like. Um, but swallowtail caterpillars have a really cool defense mechanism where they stick out this kind of forked organ on their head. It's called, called an osmotarium, and it smells really, really bad. So I'm gonna <laughs> try to see if I can get this guy to do it, but it's a little, he doesn't, doesn't want to cooperate. It's too it. hot outside. <laughs> but if you ever try to pick up a swallowtail caterpillar and you notice a foul smell, that's where it's coming from. And they're just, it's so nice to see so many of them. Yes, and you, it's one of those caterpillars that you don't mind having in the garden, too. Exactly. All right, what do you have, Jeff? Well, I, I think if you're at the State Fair, you might see some of this growing around there on the, the grounds of the State Fair. So I have some Cytos Grandma that I brought in. And the main reason I brought this in is, you know, we get a lot of questions this time of year as we're going through hot, dry days of what I can do instead of having bluegrass or uh, fescue in my lawn in a, in, a, in a difficult spot. And so there are many native grasses that do very well um, and that can be treated much like a, a turf grass in your lawn if you'd like. Um, so especially if you have a verge area between the curb and the sidewalk, you might want to think about using something like a buffalo grass. Uh, this is side oats here. I've got a little bit of Indian grass mixed in. Uh, Blue grandma is another good one. Uh, so there's some good mixes out there from some of our, our local state seed producers that can um, you know, give you something that might do very well for you. And again, not require a lot of extra watering, not a lot of care, but yet still have something fun in the fall. And so fun to pull those seeds off. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jeff. What do we have tonight, Kyle? That is really, that's a beautiful sort of you know, variegation. It's the, it's, if you accept that sometimes plants aren't perfectly green, life is a lot, a lot better. Um, <laughs> and one thing that we've been seeing a lot of, especially with this heat that we've had, is going to be just some abiotic leaf scorch. And that's what we have going on here on this on this buckeye, and you know there's there are some diseases that can cause cause symptoms like this. But one way to to know that it's or one indication that it's um, caused by the environmental conditions that we've been having is the entire tree looks like this. And so it's, if it was a disease, we would expect it kind of from the top uh, or going from the bottom up, or maybe from the inside um, inside branches out. But this is really the entire tree, and no matter really what leaf you're looking at, it's, they have about the same level of the same level of burn on them. Now, is this hurting the hurting the tree? Not really. It's you know if we have this year after year, we can have we can end up having some um, some problems. But for the most part, it's just one of those things that happens to a lot of our trees in the heat of the summer, and just something to to deal with. All right. Thank you, Kyle. Terry, that's going to poke your eye out if you're not careful. <laughs> well, we'll try to make sure that we're very careful with this. So um, most of you know that I am uh, nicknamed the Container Queen, so I thought I would talk about fall containers for this um, sample. Um, we are seeing a lot of our plants looking not so great in our containers, and we are almost to the end of our summer growing for our summer annual containers. So I thought bringing something that would be able to show you what you could swap some of those plants out with. You can go to your local nursery and get some of these really nice um, cu um, cushion mums and then adding some additional things to kind of help fill in some of that area, like um, curly willow. You could also go and get like the, the flower picks that look like uh, colored leaves or little scarecrows or little 
um, um, straw bales. So just be able to know that you can take some of those plants that don't look all that great out of your container and swap them out and you'll have a great fall container for the next few months. All right, thanks Terry. First set of pictures goes to you, uh, Kate. <clears throat> and the first one is one picture. It comes to us from Lexington and it's simply what type of insect is this? And then you can say good, bad, ugly, or indifferent. <laughs> so I think it's beautiful, but this is a beetle larva and it's a ground beetle. Um, so it's kind of a very general name, but it's a group of beetles. They're pretty common around here and they're kind of, um, they're good. You know, as larvae, they're predators. Most adults are predators too, and they live in the soil. So maybe they'll feed on a white grub. So good to have around. All right, excellent. You have three pictures on the next one, and then you actually have another picture of sort of the same thing. So uh, this is Columbus, and he sees these funnel spider webs on shrubs and occasionally in the lawn. They really stand out with the morning dew. He says if you tap, tap it, the spider itself like shh, goes back down in there. What are these? So I think maybe another one in the, we're seeing these webs in the, in the, there we go, those little white spots in the lawn that look from a distance like they belong to Kyle. Yeah, so these are the webs of the grass spider or they're also <coughs> called funnel weevil, funnel weave, funnel weave spiders, excuse me, because of these webs that they make and they're getting really common this time of year. I often get them in like the corners of my porch, but they're lion weight predators. So their web isn't really sticky, but they rely on um, insects to come in and get tangled. So they're always at the end of that funnel and they're kind of cool and hopefully they stick around as a nice Halloween decoration. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks Kate. Jeff, uh, your first two pictures come to us from Lincoln. She says the grass in this area looks like the rest of the lawn, but after she mows, she notices a four inch area that looks like strings on the tips of the blade. Mm -hmm. Is this a weed? Is this a grass? Is this a weedy grass? What should she do about it? You know, this is a parasite. This is daughter. And, um, you know, we see it, we've had it on campus in a few areas and it's kind of difficult to get rid of what you have it. Um, so the one thing I would suggest is stop mowing where you see this, clip these areas out and collect that uh, because it produces seed and you'll kind of keep sending it out and spreading it. Um, and then I would look at doing, uh, we could do a fall uh, pre-emerge, so here in the next couple of weeks and then again in the spring to control that. All so, right. but it's persistent and it's tough to get rid of. All right, you have two picks on the next one. Uh, this is an Alliance viewer. They have 12 acres this year, about three acres has crabgrass taking over. And uh, what measures should they take? They did seed this lawn in 2020. Okay. You know, I personally, we're kind of getting to that time of year where I don't know if I would bother spraying some of the annual grasses so much. I think continue to keep it mowed. We don't want it to produce any more seed. And again, this is another, you know, we're kind of at that time for some fall pre-emerge. You may want to do one now and then again in the spring in April, early May, and then maybe another one midsummer to kind of follow up just to kind of keep this, get this under control. And after a couple of years of that, I think you can probably lay off of it. Okay, there's some crabgrass that's really happy this year. Yeah, right, right. All right, Kyle, uh, two picks for you on the first one. <clears throat> this is so much fun. This is a Roka viewer. This is from Kellen, and Kellen is 12 years old. Oh, great. <laughs> and his grandma lives by Big Blue Stem. She has this branch from her cottonwood tree. Uh, she watches the show too now with him, and he watches with his dad. She wants to know what is this and what should be done if she finds more? Nothing really. Nothing, don't worry about it. So this is, this is crown gall, um, agrobacterium, um, and so it's more, it's very ubiquitous in the soil. We can find it, find it anywhere. But what happens is this bacteria, when it infects the plant, it mimics the plant growth hormones and ends up making these galls around it. And so typically these galls are gonna be more towards the base of the plant, um, hence the name crown. But really they can occur, they can occur anywhere, um, anywhere throughout the plant. So really nothing, nothing to worry about, just one of those really cool diseases that are out there that are fun. All right, so, thanks. Good eye. <laughs> thanks, Kyle. Uh, one more here, this uh, comes to us, <clears throat> excuse me, from Raymond. 
And we actually had another viewer send in something similar. What causes roses to have black edges on the petals when they open? There are a few things that can. So, you know, um, botrytis is one of them. It's one of our fung fungal diseases. But if this was botrytis, I would there would be some kind of grayish, maybe dusty look, um, dusty appearance as well. I kind of think this is just a heat issue that the the, um, the ends of the ends of the petals got burned as they were opening and they just kind of fried. So. All right. Thank you so much, Terry. Two pictures on the first one. Uh, this, they lost some Black Hills spruce growing in the right of way. Uh, they lost them. The stumps are ground down to about 10 inches. They want to know if this, and you can see the obviously death. They want to know is Taylor juniper a good ch choice to plant here? They want to line them up in this, and apparently they don't have the same uh, concern or the same rules that we have in the urban areas that you can't plant in the right of way like that. Um, well, so yes and no. So yes, you could potentially put Taylor juniper there. Um, the thing that I would say is that the Taylor juniper is going to block your view of the street where there the spruce was limbed up so you would be able to see through that. I would probably look at something different and maybe go with some, some shrubs or something like that that would be a little more deciduous plant. Um, they're not going to take what is take up as much room. Um, I would also maybe wait at least a year, maybe two, because you don't have very much room in there. Yes, it did grind it down, but you're going to still have a lot of roots in there and all those plants are going to be competing with the old tree roots. So I would probably maybe wait, just put it down into grass or some cover crop or something like that for now, and then maybe look at something different in a year or two. All right. Thanks, Terry. Two pictures on the next one. This comes to us from Fordyce, Nebraska. For Scythia with cupped leaves, which she thinks is from drift, should she cut it back, and if so, how far, or should she let it be? Uh, yeah, this looks like um, herbicide damage or drift, and no, please don't cut it back, especially now. Two things, um, the plant is actually using those, uh, those leaves still for photosynthesis to make f food for the plant. And then if you cut it back now, the plant kind of goes into this kind of regrowth method this time of year, and it may not be hardening off before we go into the winter. So just leave it, um, and then maybe deal with it next spring if it does have some issues and some dead that you can cut out of it. All right, thanks, Terry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, dealing with insect pests is part of gardening, and it can sometimes be a full-time job. Keep in mind, though, not all insects are bad. So for our first feature tonight, extension entomologist Julie Peterson talks about insect pest management without harming the beneficials. One of the first things we might think of when we think of insects, we think of what are the bad ones? So the ones that are going to eat our garden or our trees or our crop fields. Um, but as entomologists, you know, we want you to think about what are, of course, the good insects out there as well. Um, it's important to be able to maybe recognize some of those good insects that are helping you out. I think people can think of lady beetles um, as one of those classic good insects. We know they can come and eat aphids and help us out. Um, but it might be tricky because sometimes people don't recognize all of the life stages. Um, for example, the lady beetles have larvae. So I think a lot of people are familiar with what the adult lady beetle looks like. Nice, red, shiny, spotted beetle. Um, but maybe they don't know that the larvae or the immature stage of the lady beetle looks really different. It looks like a spiky alligator and it can crawl around on the leaves of the plant and eat aphids, eat pest eggs, eat all sorts of those um, harmful pests that might be out there. One really great thing about having um, beneficial insects out there and being able to recognize them is knowing that you want them in your fields, you want them in your gardens, you don't want to remove them. So instead of going out and spraying or squishing those guys, you can actually um, keep them there and allow them to help you out by eating some pests. Um, but being able to recognize them and not remove them can be good. I've had some unfortunate conversations sometimes with people who tell me that they found something like a lady beetle larva. They didn't know what it was, and they squished them all and removed them from their garden, just not knowing that that was actually one of those really good guys out there that was helping them and 
was maybe preventing them from having to spray a pesticide um, in their garden or in their yard. There are tons of look-alikes out in the insect world, so there can be a lot of reasons why it's beneficial to an insect to look like a different insect. Um, something like a hoverfly, for example. It's a fly, it's harmless, it can't sting, but it looks like a bee or a wasp. And so that can actually give it protection from other things by looking like something that actually has a little more um, punch to it, a little more stinging or biting ability to it. Another kind of look-alike insect that's out there right now is gonna be the cicada killer wasp. These are um, very large wasps. They look really scary. Um, they look like maybe those murder hornets that were kind of popularized a few years back. We don't have those in Nebraska. Um, those are gonna be a native cicada killer. They're actually a beneficial wasp, um, very harmless. They hunt cicadas, catch them, and bring them back to their nests. Very um, low aggression, very small chance that you would actually get stung by one. You know, I think it's easy for us to think of, um, kind of off the top of our mind, those harmful insects out there, those ones we have to fight against. Um, but I think it's really important to keep in mind, what are those good guys, those allies that are helping you against the pest insects? And also just to realize a ton of insects out there aren't really bad or good. They're just kind of doing their thing in the ecosystem and they're playing an important role. Um, so we're wanting to kind of keep them out there as well. You know, people immediately want to get rid of whatever insect is eating their plants, but that can lead to a lot of very unnecessary spraying. So we want you to keep in mind there are a lot of good insects out there that are already helping you out. We want you to protect them rather than squish. Okay, Kate, you have uh, just one picture on this first one. And uh, the cucumbers are producing really well, but they have these nasty marks on the peel. Do we know what this is? Is this yours or not? I don't know for sure. If it was an insect, it could possibly be a cucumber beetle, but we generally see that feeding on the leaves. So if the leaves look okay, it's possibly something else. I don't know if anybody else on the panel has another yeah. alternative answer. But um, check the leaves. If they were a lot of holes, it could be cucumber beetles. And if that's the case, fall cleanup here is going to be really important because they'll overwinter in that leaf litter. <laughs> it could also be heat. Mm. So an irregular watering. So it could be either one of those. Just use a peeler. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kate, uh, one picture on this one also. This is uh, from Valley, Nebraska, and it's a really neat picture if you look at it, if our viewers can see the actual insect, which is a dragonfly. She's wondering, do dragonflies sleep? And they, she doesn't know what they do at night. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, insects do kind of go like dormant periods. They rest, and dragonflies, we do see them flying during the day. They are predators, so they're going to be trying to catch other things that are flying, like mosquitoes. Um, so it is a really cool picture. It's got a nice silhouette to it. All right, and one picture on the next one. So uh, he is still trying to figure out what is killing his garden. He says his garden is just about gone. So <laughs> what do we have here? <laughs> yeah, so I assume this is probably a, some sort of squash plant. Um, these are squash bug eggs and um, Squash bugs are a tough one to get rid of, and so we really promote scouting early on in the season. So starting June, if you plant squash, watermelon, cucumber next year, scout early. Any of the eggs you see, you need to squish them. If you find adults, hand remove them, put them in soapy water. Really try everything you can because they can be a pretty difficult one. And there's also a whole bunch of other insects that can devastate squash too. But these ones are the squash bugs. All right, thank you, Kate. <clears throat> Jeff, uh, this is a viewer near St. Paul along the middle loop. She wants to overseed, but she has a ton of weeds in the turf and you can see it, mm -hmm. especially in the foreground here. They wanna know, should they spray for weeds before they seed or wait until spring to work on getting rid of the weeds and then just overseed? Mm -hmm. You know, I think at this point, I mean, fall is a great time for seeding and for overseeding, um, just because a lot of times we have a little bit more control, obviously, of the temperature and the moisture and some of those things. So I think what I would do is um, go in and mow this closely 
uh, and bag it. You want to kind of make sure we pick up whatever weed seed you might have there right now. Uh, and you can compost your clippings. And then go ahead and do an over, an aerating and overseeding in there. Um, there's some good products out there right now. Mesotrion is a very good one that will help uh, allow your turf type uh, grasses germinate and will help suppress the weed seed. So I would do that. And then I might go ahead and treat that again in the spring with the same product and see if we can keep the weed seeds um, from germinating and allow the turf grass to take off. But it might take a couple years of, of that kind of process. But I would avoid doing like a pendimethalin or a barricade or that sort of more, um, I guess, more vigorous uh, pre-emergent in the spring. All right, thanks, Jeff. You have two pictures on the next one also. This comes to us from Hamilton County. Uh, she wonders what it is. It's prickly. They didn't let it bloom. They cut it off at, below the ground, but they couldn't get the roots. Okay. Yeah. It's a sow thistle, um, and it's an easily killed um, annual weed. I wouldn't worry about it too much. I mean, if they pulled it, it'll probably be fine. If you tend to think that you think you're going to have more of those, or if you have a few, again, you could use a simple turf uh, pre-emergent in that area, and that should control it. All right. Uh, three pictures on the next one. This comes to us from Denton. He is two years into a native grass and wildflower drilling. Seems to be holding the seedlings back. He has a plateau-friendly mix but he wonders what this is and is there any idea how to treat it because he mm -hmm. thinks this is kind of an issue with. Yeah, I can see that it's, it's gone in there and, and I don't know, you know, looking at that, I was thinking like a needle and thread, something like that. Um, and again, kind of like the previous one, I would be tempted, we've had some prairie seedings we've done on campus this year, and you know, it takes a few years for them to really kind of take hold. Um, I would, again, I would be in there doing some mowing, cleaning some of that up so we're not allowing that plant to continue to thrive. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes mowing it back will allow, if it does, if there is some regrowth, then you could go in and maybe spot spray with some glyphosate um, and take care of some of those things as they come up. Uh, so it'll be kind of more handwork, um, but I think that'll be your best chance for success. Okay, or he could bag up a sample and make Rocky identify it at the same <laughs> yeah, time. There we go. It would be a bail, <laughs> so a bail for Rock. All right, thanks, Jeff. All right, Kyle, uh, three pictures on the first one. This comes to us from Papillion. He's really uh, had a time with this. Beautiful yard, but then they're seeing these spots dying everywhere. This was August 13th, this started. He, 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 it's not grubs because they treated for grubs. What is this? Um, not entirely sure. You know, turf diseases can be tough. It's just a brown, nondescript spot. But the way that this turf is kind of sunken and kind of depressed on the ground, kind of look, look, looks like it's lying flat. I wonder if it's Pythium. Um, we've actually seen a lot of Pythium these last, last couple of weeks. Pythium is one of our water molds. And so when the, with how wet July was, we had a lot of, Pythium had a chance to, to kind of take hold in a lot, of, a lot of lawns. And then it loves the heat as well. And so the hot conditions that we've had this week, we've been seeing a lot of Pythium damage. I was actually out at the turf farm uh, I think it was Tuesday morning and I got out of my car and it smelled fishy because Pythium smells like fish. So if you want to prove me wrong, you can take some of that turf, throw it in a Ziploc bag, leave it on the counter overnight and then open it up and sniff it. And it should smell like fish if it's Pythium. And if it doesn't, then I'm wrong and you can send me a sample. All right. <laughs> Yuck. Okay. <laughs> you, uh, you have one picture on this first one, which is, or two, I think maybe. Nope. This is... This is just one. This is a, uh, a green bean, and it's a green bean plants that they pulled up. And this comes to us from McCook. What is this, and is this a concern? Um, I don't think it's a concern. I think this is crown gall again. Mm -hmm. um, and so crown gall has, can affect pretty much every plant that's out there. So again, eventually it may girdle that, um, girdle that stem, but really nothing to worry about on annuals for the most part. All right, and then two picks on the next one from the same viewer, from McCook. Uh, she has a cherry tree. Last year it was full of cherries, then the cherries went, but 
This is her real concern, uh, what is bubbling up all over the trunk on this one. Yeah, and I don't think this tree looks like it has a whole whole lot of years left in it. Um, this this is gamosis, and so gamosis is a fairly can be a fairly common symptom for stress that's that's occurring. Um, cherry trees also get some bacterial cankers, um, and so one of those is is a pseudomonas canker, but we can get that in the get that in the trunk as well. Well, really keep an eye on this tree um, with how defoliated it was. It really doesn't look like it's doing too great. So keep an eye on it this, this fall and then next year. If it's still having those problems, maybe you want to start thinking about a replacement. All right. Thank you, Kyle. Terry, one picture on this one first. Uh, this is a property in Lincoln. She wonders what this is and how and when to prune. Uh, this is one of the crab apples. I have no idea which one, but it will be pretty in the spring when it blooms. Um, do not prune now. Uh, just like I said earlier with the forsythia, uh, if you prune plants now, it kind of puts them into this, I need to start growing again stage. And we really don't want that going into fall. So actually the best time to prune trees would be, especially fruit trees is going into uh, spring. So when they're dormant, like March, um, or maybe the first of April, depending on how our winters go. And that way you can see all the crossing branches and stuff, and that's what you need to get out. All right, one picture on the next one. This comes to us, uh, she lives along the Niobrara near Springview. What would we do with this apple tree? It's only produced one apple in its 10 year lifespan. Um, I think that it's time to be looking <laughs> online for a new apple tree. <laughs> <laughs> or go to your local garden center. Or, or your farmer's market or wherever you'd like to go to find some apples, but I think that one is pretty much done. Okay, three picks on the next one. This is an autumn blaze maple, yellow leaves with dark brown tips and spots, treated with iron and sulfur about a month ago. Uh, what now? Um, so normally we don't uh, recommend treating anything unless you have some kind of soil test or something to know really what you need to put in it. Um, I think that this might have something to do with some of the drought that we've been having too. So I'm actually going to turn this over to Jeff because he's actually dealt with this stuff um, on campus. I know when we had our 2012 drought, Jeff, you said mm -hmm. that you had a lot of bald cypress and maples that kind of look like this and they've struggled since. Yeah, yeah, I think especially in this area with our soils, our soil pH being so high, they're really susceptible to this kind of chlorosis and it's hard to, uh, it's hard to change that. You know, Rock always talks about that, you know, this, our soil is an ocean and you're trying, you're getting your eyedropper trying to change the pH and you're just not gonna be able to do it. So, um, you know, the tree isn't dead yet. You can give it another year, but I think that at some point you might want to think about replacing. All right, thanks guys. Well, before we go to break, let's take a few minutes to hear from Terry out in the garden. The heat has fried a few plants, but we are still having another great season in the Backyard Farmer Garden. In the backyard farmer garden, the garden's struggling a little bit just because of this excessive heat that we're having. We're seeing a lot of flowers die back and, and a lot of kind of death in it. We're having to turn the irrigation on a couple extra times a week just to help them get through this heat. So we're just really babying our plants and you should really be making sure that you're doing that too. We're also seeing some of those summer weeds pop up. We're making sure that we're picking those out before they go to seed so they're not adding any extra seeds to our seed bank in our soil. We're also opening our shed door on Tuesday nights for you to bring your extra produce to the backyard farmer garden to donate to the Husker Pantry. I wanna thank all of you that have been coming to do that. This week we had almost 200 pounds of produce donated. So thank you so much. We'll continue that through September into the first Tuesday in October. So if you have extra produce, drop it by and stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Of course, right now it is time for the lightning round. Terry, you are first up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we have questions from people who want to know about replacing the container soil if they just did it this spring, but they want to plant those great fall plants that you just suggested. 
Nope, you can do it just once a year in the spring is fine. All right, uh, we have a viewer who wants to know how they kill the clumps, they're calling them clumps of honey locust sprouts without killing the main tree. Oh. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> Pass. <laughs> uh, we have a viewer from Council Bluffs who wants to know whether they can solarize now with clean, clear plastic and leave that plastic on till spring. No. The same viewer then wants to know, regardless of our question, should they take the straw mulch off that landscape area before they do the solarizing? Yes. All right. Uh, we talked about Millennium Allium on a show, and we have a couple of people thinking they have seedlings of that Millennium. Have you seen seedlings on that before on that particular variety? Yes, in my own backyard. All right, we have one person who wants to know, is it time to bring tropical hibiscus into the house? No, I would wait a little bit. All right, nice job. Even if you did pass on one, you should have been <laughs> <Sorry>. the answer. <laughs> All right, are you ready, Kyle? Always. Uh, this is a Nebraska City viewer who says uh, the pears and apples have fallen and they're bruised and rotting. Is that rot edible or should they like, no? If there's rotted fruit on the ground, I probably would not consume it. All right. We have a, a Beamer viewer who says they have blight in their garden and he checked and thinks he needs to treat the soil for the blight. Um, first, you need to find out what type of blight you're dealing with. Different plants have many different types of blight. You probably don't need to uh, treat the soil, most likely. Um, so false, false sanitation is typically the, one of the best things you can do. All right. Uh, yet again, people are wondering how to get rid of the boletes in their lawns forever. Don't. Just enjoy them. You can mow and they'll kind of be chopped up. but. Mushrooms are, are great. There's really no reason to. Most of the mushrooms that we have in Nebraska are not poisonous, so just enjoy them. They'll, it'll get hot again and they'll disappear, so don't worry about it. And on that note, you apparently thought this was heat lightning round. It's, you know, it's too hot to move fast, so we're just gonna, we're gonna take our time. <laughs> Thank you, Kyle. Okay, Jeff, are you ready? Yeah. This is a Sutton viewer who wants to know if they can spray this weekend since it's 80 plus for weeds, and if so, what should they spray with? Uh, I suppose it depends on what you're spraying, obviously. Um, but again, as I mentioned earlier, I don't know if I would worry about doing a lot of weed spraying this time of year. Again, I'm mowing things and thinking about using pre-emerge later in the year if I have weed problems. All right, this is a, a Beamer viewer who wants to know when to overseed the lawn. We're, we're getting there. I think it depends on your particular situation, but if soil moisture is good and the temperatures aren't, you know, 107, then, uh, you know, if we're in the 80s, this would be the time to do it. All right. Uh, they're also wanting to know what sort of set, setting on the spreader for Kentucky bluegrass. Well, it would depend on your spreader. I mean, we're looking at, you know, I, I guess you'll have to look at the, the seed mix you have, but it'll have an overseeding rate on there, so just follow the label on the grass. All right, how often and how much water do you put down on a new seeding? Uh, again, depends on the soil that you have. You would have to monitor it and make sure that you're maintaining an even soil moisture. So, with you know, an answer without giving you an answer, but it just depends. I mean, every you know, campus is like that. It's yeah. they're different everywhere. So exactly, no one and done on the yeah, answers. Right. right, Kate, you're up. Ready? Yes. We have a viewer who wonders if the center of an apple has brown streaks in it. Is it is that rot or is that insect frass? If it streaks and there's no holes on the outside, it's probably rot. All right. Uh, when flies bite, those regular black ones, does that mean rain? This comes from students on campus. I have never heard that, no. Really? Okay. This is a Juniata viewer who wonders if we have fig beetles in Nebraska, and are they harmful? We don't have fig beetles, but we have the closely related green June beetle, and sometimes they are, most of the time they're not. Okay, this is a Fort Calhoun viewer who wants to know whether the extreme heat will affect butterflies, their eggs, and their chrysalis for next year. It will slow their development, possibly stop it. The caterpillars will try to find shade, but yes. All right, uh, we have a viewer who is a beekeeper. Uh, this is kind of the Blue River area. 
And they wonder whether the bee boxes can get too hot and kill the bees. They can. You'll probably have to supply some extra water to the bees. All right. Nice job, all. Who won? Terry? And tie. It was a tie. Yeah, good job, good ladies. Job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Terry, what do we have for Plants of the Week? Well, we're going to uh, play off of uh, Jeff's sample. So we have some grasses here that are looking fantastic this time of year. Um, the tall one here is um, an Indian grass. So this is just like what Jeff brought or a frost grass. Then the middle one that's a little more light and kind of looks like a firework is a maiden grass. So these are natives. And then this one down here that looks like a little mustache. This is a blonde ambition. So it's a, gram or a blue grama. And a again, a really fun one to have in the garden. So it's only about 12 inches tall. Awesome, thanks Terry. <clears throat> okay, your first two uh, pictures. You have one pick on the first one, Kate. This comes to us, um, he just wants, he just saw that it was a cool picture. It's on phantom hydrangea. He's wondering, is it a good guy? It is a good guy. This is a great black digger wasp. It's a solitary wasp, so they're not aggressive, and they will catch and parasitize crickets and grasshoppers to feed their babies. All right, one pick on the next one, too. Uh, and again, he's just wanting this beautiful picture and wants to know what this is. Glacier Creek Preserve, north of Omaha. This is a very closely related, it's the gold-marked thread-waisted wasp and they will parasitize moth caterpillars. Perfect, one more on this one. This is a papillion viewer. They've been seeing this particular type of bee and they're so beautiful. What is it? This is one of the longhorn bees. You can tell by the long antennae. So it's a solitary bee and it'll nest in the ground. And two picks on the next one. This is a Sioux City, Iowa viewer. What are these? They're on the hydrangeas. Are they good or bad? They're goldenrod soldier beetles. They do feed on the pollen and the nectar, but um, they also pollinate, so they're good. All right, excellent. You have four pictures on the next one, uh, Jeff, and this is, um, this is a viewer who's having issues with this grass and their turf. They're wondering whether we can identify it, and then he's got a picture, I think, in here also close up on it and then he did spray four rounds of Roundup on it and mm -hmm. got it like this, but it still keeps coming back. You know, it looks like a foxtail barley to me, which is kind of a common annual seed. And once it gets established, it can be kind of hard to, to deal with. So I think they did fine. Now you're gonna to wanna to receive this. And again, that mesotrion with the new seeding and then think about using a pre-emerge in the spring. All right, and one picture on the next one. Uh, they have an area they'd like to renovate and plant wildflowers, sand, not watered, and cactus all over it. How do they get that cactus killed? That's a tough one. And there's some specialty herbicides out there. One that might work for you, there's a triclopyrrhiz in a lot of the poison ivy killer mixes that you can get at your, at your nursery. And that might be one to try on that to help see if we can knock that back, but it is a tough plant to get rid of. All right, Kyle, two pictures on the first one. He thinks this is a Volvariella bombacina shroom, three feet up a dead branch and a silver maple. And this is near Gretna. Is, what do you think? Um, possibly, the, unfortunately without, with kind of without seeing the bottom of it, I, it's really hard to tell. To me, it, lo it almost looks like a lepiota, um, one of our, co or kind of one of our common agarics. I would guess there's gills on the bottom, but unfortunately from the pictures, we don't, can't, can't really give a good idea on this one. All right, uh, two pictures on the next one. These freaky little friends are growing underneath their pergola right here in Lincoln. Oh, so cool. So <laughs> these are, these are earth stars. Um, they're one of some of our gastromycete mushrooms. So basically stomach mushrooms because the pores are in a sack that looks like a stomach. Kind of look like an onion before they, before they mature and open up like that. Um, not toxic, not, not harmful at all, so enjoy them. All right, and one pick on the next one. Is this beneficial? And a jelly ear, he found it on a black walnut. Uh, this does look like a jelly ear to me. Um, it's 
Typically, it's a sign that, that that branch is declining, so keep an eye on it. All right, and one more. Fascinating mushroom growing in the landscape. What is this one, and is it poisonous? Yeah, this looks a lot like a Ganoderma mushroom, which we typically see kind of growing as a shelf mushroom up on the, um, on the trees, and so I'm, I'm curious that if it's growing out of, out of the mulch. Don't see it on the ground very often, but, but we can, so, um, not, and not poisonous. So cool. Just something to see. Shroom time. All mm -hmm. right, thanks, Kyle. Terry, two pictures on the first one here. Uh, they want to know what this vining plant is. It's growing over hedges, along fences, within a large ornamental grass. What is this, since we have this in our garden? So this is sweet autumn clematis, and it will make a really pretty flower in the fall, and then it will turn into these fluffy things that will fly all over, and that's probably how you got it. Um, the best thing to do is to try to pull it off as the plants that you want to keep, and then you're probably going to have to use like a, oh, a three-way uh, stump killer or something to kind of cut it back because it's a it's going to be a woody vine. All right, uh, three pictures on the next one too. This is uh, somebody who had a tomato, three sweet 100s, and this came up, and she thinks this is not a tomato. No, <laughs> this is kind of cool actually. Um, so this is water hemp. It's um, Something that is an annual here, just kind of pull it out of the garden. Don't let it go to seed, so you'll, you'll have a ton of them next year. All right, and two on the next one. This comes to us from Verdon. It's a three-year-old limelight, and it's on standard. Protected area, full sun. Uh, she wonders if this is dying, and should she remove it? Yeah, this is pretty much dead. Um, most of those times, they're on a standard, and they're sometimes they're um, pruned back like that, but most of the time they're um, they're put on there by grafting, so it's dead. And it had some mold on it for Kyle, so. Okay, <laughs> start over. <laughs> you know, we don't really associate Nebraska as a place where you can grow fig trees. On our trip out west this year, we discovered a tree that's been going strong for years. We're gonna wrap up tonight's features by taking a look at a greenhouse fig tree. This community greenhouse in Garing features passive solar heating and is a host for a seasonal farmer's market. But there's one thing that this greenhouse features that might not be in many other greenhouses. Volunteer Tina Lou says, this fig tree has been part of the greenhouse since it was constructed. She says people from Gearing come for the farmer's market, and most of them leave with their share of figs. So this is the Community Evergreen House in Gearing, Nebraska. We have a very large fig tree that was planted in the early 80s um, when this building was made. And uh, so we, we have to cut it back every year because it gets too tall for here but um, it's popular in town. People buy figs from us for $5 a pound. Well, we start seeing figs develop probably in, um, probably end of May, 1st of June, but we don't harvest anything until mid-July. But we will have them until October if it's a, if it's a good year. The, the fig tree is a deciduous tree, and so it loses its leaves, um, usually late October, November, they start dropping. And so, yeah, the first of the year, you know, for the several months thereafter, of course, we have to keep them cleaned up and then we trim it back. The city brings their people in and uh, they do the, the pruning on the tree in the early spring. And usually there's already leaves on there by oh, February, March. Um, it's set in its leaves and the figs, like I say, they'll start you'll see their little nubs starting pretty darn early in the year. And, um, and like I said, they go until, until July when we can start picking them. This greenhouse is heated by um, passive solar. So the barrels that we have against the wall get heated by the sun. And usually we don't have any problems with losing plants in here. Um, there's times when it gets to 30 below, we need to do some supplemental heat. But uh, it's hung in there. 
You know, you never know what you're going to find in a good greenhouse, and we do thank Tina for letting us take a look, and some of us who love figs are now hungry and jealous. <laughs> so we have a couple of announcements tonight. Of course, our first one is our Backyard Farmer Garden Grow a Row. You can donate those that produce Tuesdays from 4.30 to 7. We do donate it to people who need it. The second one, of course, is us at the State Fair this coming Monday, August 28th, 4.15, live Q&A, 5 p.m. That show begins, and yes, the building is air-conditioned. So, on that note, Kate, two pictures on your first one here. This comes to us from Duluth, Minnesota. The pics are a little hard to see, but if you look in the eave there under that satellite dish on picture one, picture two on this one is what they found. Uh, it appears to be wasps going in and out, and she wants to know by the nests is the severity of concern and should professionals ca be called to remove that nest? So it looks like it's a yellow jacket wasp nest and yellow jackets are very stingy. Yes, um, they'll get aggressive trying to protect that nest and we usually actually see them nesting in the ground. We don't see aerial too often, but um, because of the risk, I would try contacting a professional first and if you're around the nest, you know, try to avoid the area, but you should wear protective clothing too. All right, uh, one picture on the next one. Excuse me, this is a little tricky to see, but uh, a Lincoln viewer has a raised bed where lettuces were growing. She's got all these bitty bugs. They're no, longer, uh, no larger than an eighth of an inch and they're just everywhere. So it's a bit hard to see from this picture, but it kind of looks like it's another one of those ground beetles. So that first picture I had was a ground beetle larva. Um, we get all sorts of different kinds. Most are predators, some do feed on um, seeds, but it's really hard to tell from the picture, but it's, it's a beetle at the very least. Yeah. All right, and one more, and uh, she wonders, does this look like a fungus gnat or one of those red-eyed fruit flies, or is it some new strain they've been talking about? It's most likely a fruit fly. So you just need to check places with rotting, decaying fruit, overripe things, maybe even take the trash out and clean out the recycling bin. All right, thanks, Kate. Jeff, two pictures on the first one. Uh, she says these weeds have been trimmed down Hell Creek in Omaha against the backyard fence. They're growing up everybody's fence again. They're starting to flower. Is there anything they can do and what are they? So your second picture shows us these mm. hoppy vines. Yeah. So, you know, if they're hops, then they're going to be pretty aggressive. And um, once you get them started, I've grown hops and it were great. And then when I decided I didn't want to grow hops anymore, they kept coming back. So, mm -hmm. um, so you're going to want to look at, again, treating with something, like I mentioned before, the triclopur, some sort of um, three-way mix that you can get, and um, you're going to have to be persistent with it. All right, thank you. And you have one picture on the next one also. This comes to us from Shadron, um, and uh, they saw it at Fort Robb. They want to know how you can actually control it. This is silver lace fine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this is gonna be, you know, so these are two different things. I mean, they're both viney. You know, the one, the hops are gonna spread more, you know, underground, right, through rhizomes and that sort of thing. Uh, this is gonna be more from seed. So this is part of that polygonum family. So, you know, I think I would try to make sure that they don't continue to flower. That would be the one thing. And then again, treating with a, a three-way herbicide, kind of a stump killer uh, uh, on those, cut that and treat the stumps. All right, thanks. Kyle, two pictures on the first one. Um, this is a new growth on the pumpkins, became lighter green with curly mottling leaves. Growth then changed to almost all, so you can see that silvery. His concern on this one is: is this pumpkin vine mosaic does not appear on the does not appear on the new vines? Mm -hmm. um, it certainly looks viral to me. There's a lot of different viruses that um, that, that that different cucurbits can get. Could be could be yellow vine, could be squash mosaic virus, could be pumpkin mosaic virus. Really, without doing a lab test, there's no way to to confirm. But it certainly looks viral, and there's really no controls for it, so it would just be a removal situation. Okay, and you know, actually, another question associated with that is: should he expect that next year? And are there any resistant varieties? There are likely some. Well. You need to figure out which virus you're actually dealing with before we can do the resistant varieties, um, and so we would have to have to test that. There are likely some varieties that are resistant, 
As far as next year, if you if you aren't rotating your your plants, um, there's a chance you will see it again next year, because there's um, a lot of those viruses will um, they can survive in other weedy hosts. And so, anything else around the garden, if you have any um, any wild cucumber or anything like that, that can harbor a lot of those too. So. All right, and don't put those vines in the compost. Yes. All right, uh, you have two pictures on the next one, Hastings. <laughs> Hastings, uh, Hastings viewer, Kyle. Okay. Not <laughs> Hastings. <laughs> so uh, this Hastings viewer found this in their lawn under a pin oak, good for scale, mm -hmm. uh, good for the underside of the of the uh, shroom on that. She wonders what this is and, and what should she do about this one? Yeah, so I think this it's one of another one of our bowl eats because we have the pores underneath. I think this is a suede bowl eat. And so we have a lot of bowl eats that have kind of a reddish orange cap, but then they'll bruise blue when you pull them. And so I'm guessing when she pulled those up, they were yellow on the underside and then they turned blue. They're just feeding on the on the pin oak roots most likely. And so they're not they're not causing major issues. Um, as long as the tree is there, you will continue to have these mushrooms pop up. You can just kick them uh, to get rid of them. So. All right, and one more. Uh, this is a Deschler viewer. This happens every summer on these peonies. There is shade most of the day. What is this, and how do you deal with it? It's a nice, nice light white variety of peony um, with powdery mildew. And so powdery mildew thrives in shady, wet, conditions. If you're dealing with it every year, I would maybe think about doing some pruning that, um, to in, uh, increase light in that area. That will, that will decrease the powdery mildew. You can, there are some fungicides or copper products that can be applied, but generally they're not warranted in a, in a home situation. All right. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, Terry, you have three pictures on the first one, and you may have a little back and forth with Kyle on this one. This is a cottonwood tree uh, near the calamus, and a 25 years ago as a sprig. Last few years, it's looked like this. And uh, the question here is, should they go ahead and cut it down? And what is the this? Well, I mean, they have uh, some included bark. They have some issues where there's some rot in where the two leaders are coming up out of the tree. Should have been cut back when they were small, but unfortunately that didn't happen. So we've um, come to this position. I would probably recommend taking this down. Um, Kyle can tell canker? me whether or not, but. It, yeah, yeah it, it easily could be in that, you know, especially that where the, the location of that yep. canker, that's going to be a very weak point in the tree forever going yep. forward, and so. My other concern was that it was very close to the house. Right, yep. so. Yep. All right. Terry, you have two pictures on the next one. This comes to us from Fremont. This is a uh, new red leaves are appearing but are turning brown and falling off of this Japanese uh, maple. This looks like Crimson Queen. She waters twice weekly. It's on the southwest side of a garage. Yeah, I think this is a, a management and, and a heat issue. So you're gonna have some reflective heat off of that brick wall and you have reflective heat coming off of the mulch that is rock. So most likely that's what that is. It's also probably getting way too much heat right now. So they're just really not happy. They like it cool and shady. They like our courtyard. <laughs> they do like our courtyard. <laughs> All right, and you have one final picture tonight, uh, Terry. This comes to us from a Lincoln viewer. She's, her question is, how tall do marigolds get? Because I guess that's probably a five or a six foot fence. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it could be maybe a four foot two, but they can get four foot, five foot. It depends on which variety you choose. How, how big are the uh, biggest ones we've ever had in our garden? So the ones in our garden, the big duck and orange duck and all those, they get to be, oh, 36 inches, so three foot. As opposed to six. Well, yeah, not six, but three. <laughs> three, half of six. <laughs> all right, still fun to see it happen like that.